We were newly married and learning what it meant to be married as we balanced our life in Covington, Georgia. Bill was serving in his first call as an associate pastor while I was serving as an interim chaplain at Agnes Scott College. In one of our first social acts as a married couple, we decided to play together on the church's co-ed softball team. Our team was a gathering of eclectic folks of varying athletic ability, as is often found on church softball teams. One evening, I forgot to take the warm-up ball out with me upon taking the field. So our coach, Bill, was throwing one out to me. However, I was doing something else, probably talking to the first base coach or the umpire or something. And when Bill threw the ball to me, he quickly realized I was not paying attention. And if he didn't do something quick, his absolutely gorgeous bride would end up with a black eye. So Bill quickly yelled out, Cunningham! To which I immediately looked up in time to catch the ball as it was thrown to me. Bill, remembering that we were newly married, knew if he called out, Goss, I would not respond because I was still growing accustomed to my new last name. Bill knew just how to get my attention. And getting our attention is precisely what scripture, this morning's scripture is all about. Now the community has gathered in Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Weeks. This festival is one of the big three in the Jewish faith. Passover, when the Jewish community celebrates Moses leading them out of slavery and out of Egypt. Uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, where the Jewish community celebrates their time in the wilderness. And the Feast of Weeks, which celebrates God's giving of the law, the Ten Commandments, to Moses on Mount Sinai. These festivals are a big deal. People would travel from far distances to come and celebrate in Jerusalem, and because of the timing of this particular festival, it corresponded with great travel conditions, so there was a larger-than-usual crowd in Jerusalem on that day. Add to it that the law said there was no work to be done on that day, and you get an economically and geographically diverse crowd gathered. Now, a crowd of that size must have created a considerable amount of noise, voices layering on top of each other. I imagine it's similar to what it's like here right before worship, people greeting one another, last sips of coffee going down before running down the aisle to take your seats, the rustling of papers, a wave across the pew at some friends, maybe even a quick question or two of church business, or even a late pastor rushing down the side aisle with a click of her heels, all creating the normal buzz of a lively congregation. Now magnify that a few times, and you get the idea of the noise, the background noise that was present on that day. And it is in the middle of this gathered crowd, in the middle of this noise, it began. It started with wind. More specifically, Luke describes a rush of violent wind that filled the place where they were gathered. It must have been quite a gust, perhaps something like the new airport security detectors that use this burst of air to sniff for explosives, or the rush of air that you get when you open the doors of a store or a restaurant in the middle of a deep, humid summer and that air conditioning smacks you in the face. It's jarring, but it caught their attention and made them pay attention. Next came the visual effects. The tongues of fire are what appeared like tongues of fire, dancing and flickering until resting upon each one gathered there. Not that the people were on fire, but that it was obvious something was upon each of them, something that resembled flames. I can only imagine the confusion and the surprise of all of those gathered. The once chattering crowd must have become speechless, startled by the gust and the flames, watching in fear and apprehension as well as awe and wonder. And rounding out this multi-sensory experience, the people began speaking, not only in the universal Greek language of the time, but in their native tongues. 
Luke records 16 different languages, but perhaps even more were present. And all of a sudden, they were speaking the languages of their homelands, and they were not politely taking turns, but rather speaking all at once. Can you imagine that cacophony of voices? We only heard five. Imagine 16 or more. That rich layering of sounds building upon each other. And yet, for some reason, they were able to decipher the spoken message clearly. They were able to hear, the pro- hear a voice proclaiming God's deeds of great power. Somehow, and in some way, All of the disciples and apostles were granted the ability to share what they knew and had experienced of God through the life, death, and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. And somehow, everyone gathered heard it and understood what was said. It must have been amazing. And then it was over almost as quickly as it started. And when they were finally able to put it all together, the reaction of the gathered crowd was mixed. Some were amazed and perplexed, trying to determine what exactly had just happened and what did it mean, while others were quick quick to blow off the experience as the effects of some very potent alcohol. What an odd story. I imagine it much like a Hollywood blockbuster, complete with pyrotechnics and five-star special effects. Now, scholars do believe that Luke took some liberties with this Pentecost account, but he does so to make a point. Luke wants to make it clear to those who read this account, the Holy Spirit has entered the building. Luke emphasizes this Hollywood-type entrance of the Spirit to alert us of the importance of this event. Luke wants the reader to pay attention because the gift of the Holy Spirit, it is a big deal. The first Pentecost reminds us that God is yet again breaking into the world in unexpected ways and acting through unexpected actions. At this first Pentecost, God's Spirit entered the world and came to stay, to rest with, and to breathe life into this new and unique community of faith. Much like God breathed into creation in Genesis, God is now breathing the Holy Spirit into the church. With one breath, this new and unique community of faith comes to life, and the church is born. The Holy Spirit that filled the apostles present on that first Pentecost, it continues to fill us in the world today. The Holy Spirit continues to guide the church along, using the power given by God to us. And somehow, this fractured community full of all different and amazing people is drawn together to follow the Spirit and to live as God's servants in the world. This Holy Spirit comes to us and infuses us with the ability to share the living witness of the life of Jesus Christ, to share the very love of God. Something like that is surely worth our attention. I realize that this Holy Spirit can be difficult, a difficult concept to grasp, especially when it is something we rarely preach on, we rarely talk about, and we certainly take for granted. At least those gathered on that Pentecost day were able to see the power of the Spirit. They were able to see the wind and the fire signs. They were able to experience firsthand the power and the results of that Holy Spirit. And while they may not have fully grasped what was happening at the time, they did have the benefit of witnessing firsthand that awe-inspiring event. But for us today, we rarely see the Holy Spirit manifested in that day way. I've never experienced a huge rush of wind in this sanctuary, nor have I seen dancing flames over your head. I might like to see that, but I haven't been able to decipher any other language, to be honest, except for the one I'm speaking right now. So if the Spirit came to the church 2,000 years ago, how do we know it's here today? Theologian Tom Long shared this story about the Holy Spirit in one of his books. He writes, 
A few years back, I was preaching one Sunday morning in a church where as a part of the regular Sunday service, a member of the congregation would speak for a few minutes about the experience of God in his or her life, almost a personal testimony. This Sunday I was there, a person doing this was a young woman who was a dancer in a professional ballet company. It was obvious that she was more comfortable as a dancer than a speaker. She trembled a bit as she spoke, but she spoke nonetheless. She told the congregation that she had grown up and been baptized in this church. And then she pointed to the baptismal font and said, in fact, I was baptized right over there. I don't remember it. I was just a baby. But my father used to love to tell me about the day I was baptized. He would tell me with delight about the dress I wore, about the relatives who came to that service, about the hymns we sang on that day, about what the minister said in his sermon. And he would always end the story by exclaiming, Oh, honey, the Holy Spirit was in the church that day. But as a child restless in worship, she continued, I would wonder, where is the Holy Spirit in this church now? She moved her finger away from the font. She began to point to various places in the sanctuary. Is the Holy Spirit in the rafters? Is it in the organ pipes? Is it in the stained glass windows? Then her voice softened. As many of you know, I lost both of my parents in the same week last winter. In the midst of that terrible week, I was driving home from the hospital, having visited my parents, knowing that I might never see them alive again. And I stopped by the church just to think and to pray. Sarah Graham was in the church kitchen, getting ready for a family night supper, and she saw me sitting all by myself in one of the back pews. She knew what was happening in my life, knew about my parents. She took off her apron, and she came, and she sat beside me, holding my hand and praying with me. It was then that I knew where the Holy Spirit was in my church. Friends, we might not see tongues of fire or hear loud rushing wind or even a cacophony of voices, but you do know the Holy Spirit is in this place, don't you? The Holy Spirit is moving through the appreciative inquiry process and helping us determine what Overbrook's next steps are. The Holy Spirit is moving when our members need extra care and you respond with cards and calls and visits and casseroles and holding their hand. The Holy Spirit is moving when you gather before and after worship and seek the faces of those who are visiting or maybe just seek the faces of those that don't look familiar to you and you make an extra effort to remember their name. And the Holy Spirit is moving as we celebrate 100 years of being Overbrook Church and as we look forward to celebrating so many more. But the Holy Spirit doesn't just stay within these walls. No, friends, the Holy Spirit moves. The Holy Spirit is always moving. The Holy Spirit is moving when our group heads out to the YWCA or Hogue Memorial to fix and serve their evening meal because we know no one deserves an empty stomach. The Holy Spirit is moving when we share our money with the Pentecost offering that helps fund young adult missionaries, that helps provide educational opportunities for at-risk children, that helps support youth programs that help foster a stronger connection to God. The Holy Spirit travels with our youth on their mission trip to Asheville, North Carolina, with our high school students as they go off to college, and with our children who bring the gift of shoes to Vacation Bible School so that they can help others have a pair to wear somewhere in our community. The Holy Spirit moves with our deacons and our Stephen ministers to hospitals, to long-term care facilities, and to bedsides where they hold hands, they say prayers, and they grieve alongside those who might never make it back to their home. Friends, the Holy Spirit has entered the building, 
but it is not in the rafters or the organ pipes or even the church offices. It is here in this place in you and in me. The Holy Spirit doesn't reside in a building. It resides in each of us, placed here in one breath by our Creator. And it is guiding us and leading us and already inspiring us to share the very love of God with each and every person that we meet. The Spirit is surely moving here at Overbrook and working to get our attention each and every day. And my prayer is that we are inspired enough to keep moving with it and have faith wherever it leads us. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, Amen.